We're getting close to ordination season uh, here in the diocese and most dioceses. Uh, this year we'll have uh, one priest and then five transitional deacons who hopefully will be ordained to the priesthood the following year. But typically in this diocese, you're ordained uh, usually Saturday morning. Uh, and then the next day you have what is traditionally called the first mass. So it's not really the, the guy's first mass. Uh, it's actually his second mass. His first mass is at his ordination where he con celebrates with the bishop on his ordination day. But it's the first time that following Sunday where he'll see, be the principal celebrant for the very first time. And a lot of times it's customary where guys will like to make up little holy cards to give out to the people that attend his first mass as a way to commemorate and remember the event. And usually the holy card has a, a picture, some sort of religious picture on the front. And then on the back is usually the, the date of his ordination, the date of his first mass, and maybe a line from sacred scripture, you know, as a, as a way of inspiration. And so for me, uh, about, I guess, 13 years ago now, uh, I don't know, I lose track after 10, you know what I mean? Uh, I think I get a watch or something at 25, I don't know, not, you know what I mean? But, but anyways, on mine, the picture is this gospel passage, the way to Emmaus. It's Jesus and two of his disciples, and you kind of can see the back of them. It's kind of a famous picture, I don't know who, who drew it, but, but that's the front. On the back, I have from, from today's gospel, uh, were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened scripture to us. That's the quote I put on the back uh, on, on all that. And so I bring this up because the picture, again, has Jesus and two disciples. And the artist who drew that picture made this assumption, which I think is an erroneous assumption. It's an assumption that I made. And maybe it's an assumption that you made. We assume in this passage that you have Jesus, you have, and then you have these two disciples, and we believe that they're what? That they're men. That's the assumption, and I think maybe, maybe an erroneous assumption. And here's why. Like I said, the gospel passage starts with these two disciples who are supposed to be in Jerusalem where everything is happening. Jesus died. Now there's rumors of him rising from the dead. But they should be in Jerusalem. But they're not. They're walking in the wrong direction. Not just physically, but spiritually. But what happens next? Jesus catches up with them. They don't know it's him. And Jesus proceeds to walk in the wrong direction with them. Important spiritual point number one. You might find yourself walking away from God. You might have a very heavy conscience and are very ashamed and you feel yourself walking away. Maybe your prayer life has deteriorated. Or maybe you have someone that you know and love who is not here anymore. They're walking in the wrong direction, talking to the wrong people, doing the wrong things. They're all walking in the wrong direction, yourself or someone that you love. And you feel as if you're moving further away from God. But what we fail to recognize in the life of grace, that God is continually with his abiding presence, walking along with us, even if it's in the wrong direction. Very important spiritual point there. And so Jesus is walking with them. He's talking to them. And then he asks a question. What are you? What are you debating? And here's theory number one. Example proof number one that maybe it's not two men. But it's actually a man and a woman. And even more so a husband and a wife. Jesus asked them the question, what do you, it says in, in the English here, it says, what are you conversing and debating? It's very mild. It's a very mild translation. The Greek, I think, is a little bit more intense. It should be more of what are you arguing about? Husband and wife arguing with each other? Yeah, I can see that, <laughs> right? I can see that. 
What are you arguing? And then Luke gives us one of the names. This guy's name is Cleopas. Okay? It's the same guy that we hear in the Gospel of John at the foot of the cross. At the foot of the cross, John tells us that it's Mother Mary, it's Mary Magdalene, and there's this other Mary who happens to be the wife of Cleopas. And so I believe that what we have here in this passage is Cleopas, who, who Luke mentions, and his wife Mary. And so as Jesus asked that question, what are you arguing about? What are you fighting over? They stop and they look downcast. Their eyes drop. You know, have you ever had that experience You're with someone and they say, you know, you're having a pleasant conversation and all of a sudden they say, you know, how's your father doing? And your father's sick. So as soon as they ask that question, it kind of stops you in your place. Your mood changes quickly. You look down and you're like, oh, my father's really sick. You know, that's what's happening here. They stop and they look down. Why? Because their hearts are broken. Their hearts are broken. They thought they had it figured out. They thought they had the Messiah. They thought that God has truly come to them. And then maybe now they believe that God has let them down. Because they recount the story how they really believe that this man, Jesus, was really someone special. But he was humiliated and then crucified. And what they're probably arguing about is, is that Mary, Mary probably visited the tomb and saw it empty. And, and, and her husband are, is probably like saying, no, you're crazy. What are you talking about? You know, you probably went to the wrong tomb again. You, you know what I mean? Like, like that type of mentality. Like the, they're arguing, they're trying to make sense as to what is happening. But either way, since their hearts are broken and since they believe that God has let them down, they're moving away from the things that remind them of Jesus in this case, Jerusalem. It's too hard to bear. It's too hard to take. You know, we do that too when someone that we care about dies. You know, some of us maybe want to like not throw anything out. We want to keep it as much as we can because it reminds us of them. And then others, sometimes we, we don't want to be reminded. We want to move on. And so we get rid of everything, you know, that, that reminds us of someone because we can't take it. We, we can't have it in, in the presence. And I think that's what's going on here. Their hearts are broken. They got to get away. And again, the resurrection is not even, not even in the forefront of their minds. The empty tomb is, but not the resurrection. And so Jesus, as he's walking along with them in the wrong way, though, does rebuke them. Rebukes them. Why? Not because they don't know scripture, but because they don't believe it. He's challenging the faith. He's going right after the faith and he's asking them to step up their game. And so now we get to the location. We get to Emmaus. We get to their dwelling place, maybe their house. Again, another reason why this might be a husband and wife thing. And they want Jesus to stay because Jesus gives them the best, the world's greatest Bible study ever. As he breaks open the Old Testament and shows them how the Messiah must suffer and die before entering in his glory. The best Bible study ever. Boy, I would have been a fly on the wall to, to hear what he was saying. And so their hearts are changing. Their broken hearts now are becoming alive. They're becoming on fire. And here's the final reason why I believe, and really the main point of all this. The main point as to why this is a husband and a wife. Jesus takes bread. We know, we know this language takes bread, says the breast, and bro broke it and gave it to them. The language of the Eucharist, the language that I say right here before I elevate the host. And immediately when he does that, what happens? Their eyes are open. And this is why I believe this is a husband and wife. Because Luke clearly is making an allusion to another event back where back to the book of Genesis, to the first married couple, Adam and Eve. What happens to their eyes? When they partake of the fruit of the knowledge of, of good and evil, when they reject God's command, when they want to live life radically separated from God and live their own life, they partake of that fruit. What happens? Their eyes are open. It's the exact same phrase. Their eyes are open. 
But this time, what? Shame comes into the picture. They now truly see what life without God is like. And they're afraid. And they're ashamed. And they're embarrassed. But now, we have a new, a new couple. And now their eyes are open. But what happens? With the breaking open of Scripture, with the receiving of the Eucharist, their eyes are open, but what? They're filled with joy. Why? Because the tree of life, the tree of life where Adam and Eve were banished from in the garden, the tree of life is now made present to them again. That's the tree of life. And from that tree of life, we partake of the fruit of that tree in the Holy Eucharist. Under the sacrament of bread and wine, the Holy Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity, the real presence of Jesus Christ, under the appearance of bread and wine. But that is how our Lord makes his presence known to us again. Because at the end of the story, they say, they say, Lord, stay with us. Well, they don't say Lord yet, but they say to the man, stay with us. Stay with us for it's evening. And our Lord truly grants their request. But just in a different way, he grants the repressed to stay with them, to continue along their journey, whether they're going in the right direction or going in the wrong direction. Either way, whether you are going in the right or wrong direction, our Lord is with you. And if you need a visual reminder of that, you come to the Eucharist, you come to adoration, especially on Monday nights at the chapel, or you come to Mass, you look at the Eucharist and you're reminded of God's ever abiding presence with you. No matter which way you are going in life, away or towards. If you're going away, he's going he's gonna to he's gonna be with you for the purpose of what? Of trying to bring you back on the right path. And if you're on the right path, he's going to encourage you. Because the more that you're on the right path of life, the harder it's going to get and the heavier the crosses are going to be to carry. Because it's patterned after the life of our Lord. But either way, the Eucharist, the breaking of the bread, is our Lord's reminder of his presence with us and so that's when they recognize him and they recognize him forever and they run back to jerusalem they go back in the right direction to share the excitement that our lord is truly risen and we too on the path of the lord no matter where we're headed in life our lord is with us whether in the right direction or in the wrong direction and the eucharist it's always a reminder of that. May God bless you.